Check one, check two. Check one, check two. Let me check. Let me check a few things before we get started. This is my excellent condition. Let me know in the chat. I mean, let me know if it sounds pretty good. Um, if you got any questions, just uh, put them in the chat. We're gonna do uh, network security devices, design and technologies. Um, uh, go check out uh, Network Bra and uh, Dewan Lightfoot. Both of them are uh, <laughs> networking geniuses. So we're gonna actually talk about uh, network security uh, design. Like I said, we'll go through there, but I always go, especially the Network Bra. He actually does his lab, so I actually go over there and uh, check him out on those uh, on Network Bra doing those lab. I'm actually gonna put his. Uh, channel in the description after this so that'll be an excellent resource once again if you got any questions or let me know if i'm echoing <laughs> i changed my setup a little bit still working on it. um so we're about to get started you see it on there you see it let's get it computer security plus guideline i'm going to talk about network security devices uh design and technology what's up breaking into tech glad you could join me like I said, we're just going to go to this uh, introduction to security today. We're actually focusing on network security devices and design and technology. Once again, I'm a uh, network bro and uh, Dewan Lightfoot, of course, are experts in that area. Um, of course, when you do security, the base of security is networking and how it moves and how it's operating. So let's go on and uh, let's say. Let's get started. If you got any questions, just drop them in the uh, chat. I'll answer them. Uh, it don't have to be on networking. You can always pivot. <laughs> so. Security through network devices. Security can be achieved through using security features found in standard networking, as well as hardware design and primarily for security. What's up, keep it tech in the house? <laughs> My, the latest experts in the house. What's going on, man? So, um, once again, we're going to talk about network security from a security perspective. Like I said, shout out to uh, Network Bra and the Wine Life List. They're experts in this area. So, uh, we're going to talk about the basics of it and, and how that actually relates to security. The standard network devices can be classified as an OSI layer, OSI model, and networking into seven layers. So if you're going to sit for the test, it's boring. You got to memorize these layers, and it actually sits on top of each other. Each layer is the uh, different networking tasks. Each layer co cooperates with the adjacent layer. Security functions of the network uh, devices can provide a degree of networking. And properly configured network devices can introduce vulnerabil vulnerabilities, bridges, switches, router loads, balancer, and proxies. So one of the things, especially from uh, Keep It Techie, is Linux networking, CIDRs, subnets, and how you set it up. Even on a basic small network, right? You're gonna have your bridges, routers, load balancers, and switches. I work with big companies and little companies. You, from a cyber security standpoint, you gotta understand networking because that's what everything sits on. When you go up to uh, AWS, they have DPC, which is a virtual uh, <coughs> Personal component, um, components, which is a uh, virtual network in the cloud. So even if you're up in uh, AWS, you got to set up your VPC, which is basically your uh, subnets, your VLANs, and how you move traffic with your routing inside the cloud. So even if you're on prem or in the cloud, you, you got to understand basic networking because that's the first part of security. What is a bridge? A bridge is a device or software that's joined two separate computer systems. Network to communicate between them uh, can connect two local networks or two network segments. Operator at a data link layer, so all networks and segments connected must use the same layer two protocols such as Ethernet. Right, most of us allow software bridge to connect between networks. Creating a software bridge creates a security vulnerability. Right, the reason a bridge creates a security vulnerability. Right, is you're just moving packets from one side to the other. You're not checking them. You're not checking where they came from. We're going to get further in there. 
Uh, there's a source and destination IPs on those networks that you can check from a networking component. So all that kind of stacks on top of each other. So that shows you setting up a uh, Microsoft Windows software uh, bridge. It's showing you the Ethernet, disable it, or you can bridge the component. So that's showing you how to do it from a Microsoft level. The most common things you're going to have in here is, are switches, right? So when you go up to Amazon Azure, you're actually setting up uh, virtual networks inside their uh, switches. All right. Switch a device that connect to networks hosts intelligently can learn which devices connect to each of the ports, examine the MAC address of a frame that receives and associates to the MAC address of the device connected to that port. So when you have a PC uh, network in it, there's a MAC address that that's, uh, it's like a, a driver's license for each uh, NIC card. Each NIC card has a unique MAC address. So with that MAC address, I can only say this NIC card and this computer can only go to this uh, server, go through this VLAN, or I can just say only go to this particular part of the company. So that's, again, how security um, uses MAC addresses to control your network behind the scenes. Right? That's the introduction part. Forward frames intent to a specific device unicast instead of sending out to all the ports, which is broadcast. Important switches to pro be properly configured to provide a high degree of security. Proper configuration includes loop prevention and providing uh, a flood guard. So there's certain attacks called Smurf that you can actually uh, used to attack companies. What that attack does, it says, make this network card send out information to every server and every VLAN in that company. The cool thing is if you're using Cisco, Juniper, you can click a button, right? And it's always going to um, handle that type of uh, attack to it. So once again, it's an introduction. We're going to hit a couple slides that's going to uh, talk about that. So in the broadcast storm, you got the alpha uh, PC to the beta PC. See, you got switches A, B, C, and D. Since they're all looping back, if you start sending packets from alpha to beta, it's going to just start looping between these servers, right? And that's called a broadcast. Right? You want to have your <laughs> your network traffic loop and never endingly stop, right? So that's the definition of a broadcast. Once again, it's it's a cool thing that um the big networking companies already have that figured out. So if you had a loop back storm in your networking, uh Cisco will stop it, Juniper will stop it, uh Hewlett Packard, even small networking devices will stop it, right? So flood guard, a threat agent attempt may attempt the Mac flooding attack by overflowing the switch with ether frames that have been spoofed so that each frame has a different source of uh, address. The defense against Mac flooding attack is a flood guard port security switches. The support security can be configured to the limit, limit the number of Mac addresses that can be learned on your port. So most of those big companies you spend all that money for from a network switch attack. Uh, of course, Cisco's been a 800 pound gorilla in that, that agency. They have a flood guard built in, right? So you sort of actually protect you from those broadcast storms. But as a security analyst and introduction to security, you got to understand that, right? So you can ask those type of questions when you're doing uh, security analyst work or you're reviewing network um, setups for, for different companies. Routers for the practice across different computer networks operates at the layer three. That's the big deal from a test part. Uh, routers operate at the network layer three. Can be set to filter out specific types of network traffic by using ACLs. Access control list can also be used to limit traffic traffic entering the network from unapproved networks. Low balancers help evenly distribute work across the network and allocate requests among multiple devices. Right, so that router, the big part in there is like it can limit traffic entering the network from an approved network. So if you don't want traffic coming from the internet, you can tell your router to say, hey, if it's coming from the internet to block it. Right? Because depending on um, your network, it could be a private network just for your DBAs, just for your admins to work on. So if there's traffic coming from the internet and not your internal network, you want to block that traffic because obviously 
that's somebody trying to hack you or spoof you. So from a security perspective, you start thinking about who's acting your network, subdividing your network and saying, okay, this is an internal for a corporation. This is external where the clients have to come to the internet and get us. So then you start seeing your routers where internet traffic coming through is cool because it's outward facing, right? This is internal. So there should be no traffic coming from the internet. If it is, block it, right? Somebody's trying to hack us. Breaking into tech, could the exploitation of load balancers be considered an attack factor? Most definitely, your load balancers are actually going to be one of your most dangerous vectors because load balancers are primarily, primarily used for web server, which is outward facing to the internet. Right? Since it's outward facing to the internet, most of your attacks are going to come from the internet. Um, you very rarely going to get attacked internally unless somebody you know, got ransomware in the machine. So yeah, um, your load balancer, it could for me is the most problematic. The reason why is it's getting internet traffic to your load balancers. A lot of times is usually the first thing that gets hit because your web service is usually outward face to the internet, but it usually goes through the load balancer and the load balancer usually distributes that traffic first to which web server it wants to work to. So the load balancer definitely is for me, one of the uh, hot points on there. So you can do a web application firewall and put that on your load balancer, right? So it's going to look for SQL injection, command injection, but you are correct. The uh, load balancer definitely is going to be the first thing that's going to get. It's usually going to be the first thing that's going to get attacked in your in your corporation. So that's an excellent question. Let me get to the next slide. I'm struggling with the slides today. Here we go. Load balancer helps evenly distribute work across the network, allocates uh, requests among multiple devices. Request of load balancer technology reduce the probability of overloading a single server, optimizes the bandwidth of a network computer. Right. So the top one is easy, evenly distributed across your network band. You don't want one computer handling all your information, so your load balancer makes sure that that's even. Like we talked about, load balancers achieved through software or hardware devices. Load balancer is grouped into two categories. Layer uh, four load balancer, act upon the data found in the network and transport layer. Layer seven, distributes requests based on data found in the application layer. Different scheduling protocols on the load balancer is round robin. Meaning when the load balancer gets hit, it just gives it to the first server, then the second server, then the third server. Affinity, a lot of times, is from a, a programming perspective, your application server, your web server keeps track of session information. If you put your credit card in or you logged on, so it usually whatever web server or app server has your session information, it needs it to send it back to that server because it's keeping track of the paging. If you're on Amazon, what's the last product you did you use you, you going through the pages of Amazon? That session is kept track on the web server and app server. So the affinity makes sure it sends it back to the right place. My story short is it called, it's called the sticky, the sticky bit or the sticky server because I need to send you back to that same server to get track of your um, your session information. And the other part of that, a lot of times too, is if I'm running long queries. Uh, keep it tech is a DBA. So if I get a long running data warehouse query, it's eating up all the CPU. When I go look at that server, I'm going to say that's, that uh, CPU is at 80%. I don't want to send any more traffic to that that server, uh, app server. I want to send it to a different app server. Even though it only has two requests running on it, they could be running um, data warehouse, uh, operational data storage, just running a big query batching things so that's even though there's only two things running on it from a round one perception those two things are eating up cpu um open files so i don't want to sing anything back to that server until that server you know finishes those jobs proxies there are several types of proxies a for a proxy a computer application program that intercepts requests from the internal a network process that requests on behalf of a user. Application multi-proxy is a special server that knows the application protocols that supports it. 
rebirth proxy routes request from an external network to the correct internal server. Transparent proxy does not require any configuration on the user. So a lot of times you're going to use proxies like it sounds for how do I, uh, which one the reverse proxy you use is, you don't want people knowing your internal addresses, right? So when they come in the proxy, the proxy is going to say, hey, coming from the outside, it was 10 dot whatever. 10 dot whatever actually goes to a private address of 192. So when people come from the internet or external to your network, you really want to hide all your internal IP. So uh, nine times out of 10, it's going to come to the proxy. AO, A plus networks, <laughs> security plus, here I come. I, I got you. I'm going to support you. <laughs> Study for the next one. Okay, that's cool. Keep it techie. Oh, yeah. The Godfather, keep it techies up in the box. Everybody give him a shout out. Now, that's good, AO. You studying the right things. Um, This right here is going to be the introduction to kind of get you used to security plus. Um, I'm going to make these slides available. I'm still working on that. Um, if you have any questions, I'll just throw them in the box. Uh, so that's what proxies are used for when you go on uh, any servers. You're going to keep those proxies used. And uh, after we go through these uh, slides, I think it's 16 weeks of that, we're actually going to take all of this technology and move it up to AWS to talk about security in AWS coming from an introduction point. VPCs, like I said, setting up proxy servers. Uh, setting up web servers, app server, uh, keep it taking my roadmap. I'm a Linux guy, so I'm going to set it up using Amazon Linux 2. We're going to apply the STIGs. The STIGs are actually hardening for those uh, particular uh, uh, GPOs for uh, Windows. Then uh, Linux, they just be uh, settings. You can actually buy those, but I think we're going to manually set them. So that's what some stuff we're going to have in the future. But we're going to get through the introduction. This right here is a standard application setup. It's showing you the forward proxy. We're going to walk through each statement. So coming through, you got the uh, 1962 uh, came from the web page, 123. The forward proxy says anything with uh, 1924.6824, getting that web page, 13. If at the bottom you see 192.146. 18.254. That's actually the uh, four proxy gateway. All right, so then that's going to um, go through the internet. Then it shows you the reverse proxy, right? 194628 coming from that web page. Then that reverse proxy is acting as a load balancer. So the first one is going to go to the web server one. The second one is going to go to web server two. And uh, the third one is going to go to web server three. Right, so they're showing you the forward and reverse proxy. So that shows you the load balancer. So moving it out um, so nothing should get overwhelmed. If, if all three of those get overwhelmed, hopefully we're in a elastic thing. If we were in AWS, so you could do it on cloud, you would just automatically spin up a web server four. If both of those, if those three web servers got to 70%, you would just automatically spin up a web server four. It would uh, send this information to the reverse proxy, saying the web server four is now online. So it starts sending information to web server four, right? So now we're elastic. We, you know, we're live. We theoretically shouldn't uh, ever have a web server uh, turn over or anything because we could keep spinning up web servers um, to the group. So why, what's the advantages of proxies? Right, so what are we doing with the proxies? Increase speed, reduce costs, improve management, and stronger security. So the, the, the yeah, so the cool thing about proxies, right, is it's hiding your information from the back end. It's making sure that you can have elastic computing, right? We saw a web server in one, two, three. We would just spin up web server four. Once web server four got down to 10 or 15%, we would say, hey, take it out the pool. The last thing it runs, uh, shut down web server four. Why? Web server one, two, and three can handle the information we have coming in. Right? So that way we saving money, right? Reduce cost. Then when web server three gets to a certain point, we're like, hey, take it offline. Web server one and two can help. All right. So usually, you know, usually you keep up two small servers, 
right? And you let them, because if one of them goes down, you want the other one to already be up. You don't have to spin it up. Because VMs are pretty cheap, but that's the advantages of using uh, uh, proxy servers. And they're common, uh, especially from the security perspective. Um, network security hardware. If y'all got any questions, uh, drop them in the box. Network security hardware, specifically designed security hardware devices provide greater protection than normal standard networking. Firewalls can be software-based or hardware-based. Both types inspect packets, either accept or deny. Hardware firewalls tend to be more expensive, more difficult to configure. Software firewall rules run on a device provide protection to that device only. Only modern OSs include a software firewall, usually called a host. Right, so if you're using Linux, it's using uh, IP tables um, that's in there. Um, uh, Windows actually has one built in too. So if you were a small company, I would just spin up those hardware firewalls. Um, just use those because they're actually um, great. Um, if you don't have a lot of traffic yet, they can actually handle the volume. They can actually handle the performance too. So at the base would be the whole space firewall. So when we're talking about enterprise, uh, once again, shout out to Network Bra and Dewan. This is kind of their thing coming up with the enterprise firewall. It doesn't say what product is, but uh, I'm sorry, it's Juniper on the left. Cisco's gonna look similar. Um, so all those big enterprise, so when there you hook your um, SSH up and then you start configuring uh, which one of those ports you're going to let uh, external information in, which port application you're only going to let HTTP traffic and HTTPS because it's only web server traffic. So you can configure all that in the, the hardware end of that. And if you're working for a big company or even mid-sized company, um, you're always going to work with your network team. And from a security perspective, um, I am a security analyst in real life, so I work with our uh, Cisco team to talk about what traffic you lend through. Is it three tier? Is it four tier? Uh, like I said, uh, our administration team, what VLAN are we letting them come on? Are we letting them come in direct from their PC and their home remotely? Or are we making them use VDI boxes so they actually have to come to it? Uh, Amazon or uh, Azure VDI Bank before they come and work on our VLAN. So there's, so there's things you have to get with your enterprise team to make sure they're, you know, they're secure. And we'll talk about that. I have a couple of videos where we talk about stick checks and what what checks do you put on a Cisco router or a Juniper router to consider it's good. What's up, Will? I'm glad you could make it. So from a, a networking standpoint, once again, you're going to use your SME in a networking way. I'm going to make sure that that's set up good. Uh, so this is showing you the uh, built-in Windows firewall, um, which we use, which I help smaller companies use. And our big companies, we don't use that, or my big clients I help. I'm a consultant this because a lot of times one of my clients I help, they have 400 VMs. So to keep track of 400 firewalls across the whole network, when you can do it all that in Cisco, right? It can be difficult. So a lot of times is if you got more than 10 VMs, you're going to use the Cisco or Juniper router, right? Instead of handling each one of those small VMs. Now, if you got three web servers, two app servers in the database, I would spin up the local host VM. It's free, it's cheap, and it's good. So from the Windows firewall protective, it shows you the private work. It's not connected. Guests are public net. It shows you it's connected. Uh, shows you what the Windows firewall state is on. Incoming connections are blocked. All connections to apps that are not on the list. If it's active, then on the guest one, it says block all connections to the apps that are not on the list or, uh, or allowed apps. Active publication is the network. Notify me when the Windows firewall blocks a new app. So when you log, you can say, okay, block new traffic, notify me for email, I just block out uh, old traffic. This is a web server, so I'm, I'm only going to let web server traffic in, HTTP, HTTPS, right? I can start uh, controlling protocol, 
and the protocols with port, you know, 80, 443, those are standard points. If it's a uh, Active Directory, if it's a uh, email server, right? So you can control all that with your particular firewall. What's up, B Dub? I'm glad you can make it. So firewalls locally or in the the big uh, routers like Cisco, Juniper, right? You can figure it differently. It's, oh, this is true. Alchemy does that at the uh, internet level, though. So when you just look at Alchemy, you're blocking that stuff because they have uh, joint ventures and stuff on internet. So you can block all that stuff on the internet before it actually gets to your organization. But yeah, Alchemy does that from an internet level. So if you're getting denial of service or you want to uh, block something off, stop it at the internet level. Right, because remember the internet's basically just routers controlled by big organizations that pe our people aren't aware of. But now Alchemy has organization, but yeah, Alchemy is one of the things that could do that. But Alchemy will block them on the internet before it actually got to your Cisco server on prem. Um, we actually got attacked one time from a uh, denial of service, so we actually worked uh, got with Alchemy to block it because. All those petabytes of data was filling up our logs and stuff, so we really couldn't operate. So Alchemy blocked it out on the internet routers before it ever got to the company I was doing some consulting work. So that gave us time to, you know, <laughs> compress the logs, get rid of the logs, change some of our IP addresses to something different, right? So some of our uh, most um, profitable vendors can still work with us, right? So that, no, but yeah, Alchemy takes care of that on the internet. So, yeah, when you talk about a standard uh, firewall, this is a three-tier um, on-prem connection. And two is a lot of times uh, we'll talk about on-prem and we'll talk about what it would look like in the cloud, but it would be the same thing. Uh, if person comes through on the internet, they come through the router. The router is going to send them to the web server and to the email, right? Because the web server and the email are outward facing. Um, those who should always get you know, hit first because they're looking for web pages. Those web pages are uh, open up to the internet. Our email servers are open up to the internet for people to email us, right? So, so it comes to the web server. So this is called the DMZ, right? These web servers going to hit. But when a web server gets caught, when it goes back to the firewall to get to the application server, if the web server gets to it and it's something it doesn't like, when it goes back, try to goes back to the firewall, the firewall will block it. Somebody's trying to do SQL injection, command injection, play around with your web page, right? The firewall can look at some of that from an application firewall perspective and goes, no, nah, that looks suspicious. I'm a block and I'm not going to let you go to our application server, right? Then once you get to your application server, right, it's running your code. It's going to be C sharp, Java, uh, of Rails, there's a ton of stuff out there that people use. Then once the, the once the application calls like it, right, it's gonna go query the database. So when you go to Amazon and you you click on something you want to buy, right, it runs the Java code. Then the database comes and says, okay, it costs this much. You ordered two of them, five of them, right? It's gonna look on that database. It's gonna reach out to a customer. Their customers, do you have this in stock? Can you deliver it? What time you can deliver it? Right, all this stuff's on the on the database server level. Yeah. So when you have killer DBAs, they're making sure the database is running, they're making sure it's optimized. Right. So when the application server make a call when it goes to the database, if it's not right on the right port, the firewall is gonna block it. Oracle's 1529, 1526, I think Active Directors 389. Uh, I think MySQL is 222. I need to look up that. But the database is running on certain ports. If the application code looks at some it got from the web page, if it doesn't like it, the firewall is actually going to block it, right? Because when you go through the database, you got to make a call in a certain way, being SQL, PL SQL, C sharp. If that call is not configured in a certain way, that switch is going to actually block that code. It says something's wrong with it or it looks funky, right? So you got switches, code, database, but this actually is a three-tier architecture, which is normal web server, application server, and database. Email I always put as 
support systems. So it's always going to be on a web server because it's got to be visible to the outside world. So that, that's a that's standard setup. Right. And even if you're in the cloud, I'm a, I'm a uh, Amazon guy. So you set up your VPC, you're going to have your uh, security groups for your switches and your firewalls. And those security groups are going to look at the same thing. What port, what type of traffic and what things could get to your web server. Do you have another VLAN or subnet set up for your application server? Then that subnet will talk to your database subnet. All right. So now we're controlling routing. Now we're controlling data traffic which is huge in security. You should know your data traffic because a lot of big companies is like, oh, I didn't know this VLAN could talk to the internet. Bank One opened up their database VLAN to the internet. So instead of going through a two fire, between a firewall and two switches, it went straight to the database and they just stole all the information. Right? So controlling your network traffic is huge and being able to validate that control is huge. Right? So that's part of all this setup. So let's talk about network-based firewalls, stateless packets, inspect incoming packets, permit or denies based on the conditions set by the administrator. Stateful packets keep a record of the state of connections, making decisions based on the connections and conditions. Firewall actions on packets allow, let the uh, packet pass through, drop prevent the packet from passing into the network and send no response to the sender and reject, prevent the packet from passing in the network, but send a message to the sender, right? So a lot of times too, is you are allow it, but too, instead of rejecting it, we don't want the hacker to know that we understand what they're doing. So a lot of times we are just gonna drop their packet with no response, right? We, want, we don't wanna send something back. Now, if it's internal, Two web servers talking, making a web server call. We send an information to the bank. We want to reject that going back to the bank. Why? We want the bank to get a message to say, hey, something was wrong with those packets. Right. So if they're outward facing to the Internet, we're going to drop. We don't want to um, give the bad guy information. If it's internal, we're doing it with one of our partners, banks, uh, credit cards, information, uh, warrants, stuff like that. We're going to reject and send back a message so they know that database is uh, something's up with them. So, <laughs> breaking into tech, not in the term of SQL injection used for malicious queries to gather data, and does it also describes queries that? How deep? Uh, no, those are two different things. The first one is I'm I'm a hacker and I'm trying to get uh, you see your queries. Um, you could have uh, I've seen SQL injections done by programmers because they didn't program grammar right. And of course, uh, it could be uh, hogging the database resources. Uh, a lot of times, though, you very rarely see you very rarely see SQL injection internally to your organization because your programmers are developing. So usually they have these static SQL queries they use to touch their database. SQL injection usually means I'm adding something to that SQL to get more information than I should have, right? That makes it malicious, right? So usually the uh, second one is I know what that query is. I just didn't check with my, my database admin or I didn't check on that query. I might have been doing 100,000 records and um, testing and work fine. I got a billion records. I've actually queried billions of records. When I try to run that same query against a billion records, it was bringing too much data back. It wasn't sorting it correctly. And it actually took uh, all the database resources and used them. I seen queries actually take all the memory out of a database because it wasn't done properly. So those are a little two uh, different things. Like I said, SQL injections, usually I'm adding additional stuff to the query to make it give me the password. I'm making it trying to give me all the users in the user table so I can get their email and stuff, right? SQL injection, usually I'm adding to it. Uh, the last one is usually uh, I know what this st uh, standard query was and it wasn't written, written correctly. So network-based firewalls, rules-based firewalls to set up individual instructions to control actions. Each rule is a separate uh, 
I'm sorry, separate instructions, process, and sequence, telling the firewall what action to take, rules are stored together in one or more text files that are read when the firewall start. Rule-based systems are static in nature and cannot do anything other than what they have been configured to do. So usually um, in that firewall-based rules, it usually said, I'm letting in web traffic, I'm letting in database traffic on this particular host coming from this particular subnet. So as they stack on each other, right, those then if something's on there that's not in that rule base, it'll get to the end and goes, there was no rule for it. So I'm gonna drop that particular transaction. That's usually a bad guy trying to get to a server he wasn't supposed to get to, right? So they have all those rules. So, but uh, I think, yeah, rule base is probably one of the most common um, features from a network perspective. Application firewalls operate at a higher level of identity application that sends packets through the firewall and make decisions about actions to take. Applications can be identified by applications firewall through predefined application signature, header separation, payload analysis, a web application firewall specify application aware firewall that looks deeply into the package that carry HTTP traffic and can block specific types of HTTP traffic. Use this HTTPS, right? Because we're going to be secure. But the application aware, and once we get to uh, AWS, they have application firewall. Now I can say this is coming from an accounting system. This is coming from a manufacturing system. How can I see, if you see the header information, I can start putting, I can have the programmers put stuff in the header information. Now I can tell my network guys that this is the subnet for manufacturing. If there's no manufacturing heading ID or this uh, particular code we give it through, do not let it get to the manufacturing subnet, right? So now I'm becoming application aware of what that's doing. Payload, sometimes I can send an XML or a JSON. Inside that JSON, I could have manufacturing data or payroll data or codes. So even at the application can look at that payload analysis and can say, once again, this was a manufacturing JSON or XML. This code was supposed to be in this payload analysis. If it's not there, drop it. Somebody's trying to send us some fake information. Somebody's trying to send us a fake bank account to make it send it to somewhere else. So now I can start putting stuff in my application and make it smarter, right? So now security, the architect and the network team can get together and kind of help design what's best for this system to lock it down, right? This is introduction to security. So from a security perspective, I can add stuff to the header. I can add stuff to the payload. I can add stuff to the HTTPS request. So now I can say if this key is not in there for or this, uh, uh, yeah, um, this key is not in there, this identifier is not in there, do not let that payload go to that particular accounting department, manufacturing department. Now, so now that for the hacker to get me, he's got to have internal knowledge of those codes I'm putting inside that payload to actually attack us, right? So now we're making it a little harder for the attacker to come and get us, right, from a security perspective. This is huge now, right? Virtual private network enables authorized users to use an unsecured public network if it's, as if it was secure. Uh, <clears throat> all data transmitted between the remote device and network is encrypted. All data transmitted between the remote device and network is encrypted. Right. So now we got our keys in there. We got our public and private key. Now for the hacker to get in there, they have to steal that information to be able to uh, read our information, especially since we're remote from home. Right. So you want to start up your VPN, your remote. It's going to encrypt all your traffic in there. Types of VPN, remote access to the VPN, uses to uh, land connection, site to site. Multiple sites can connect to other sites over the Internet. Always on VPN allows the user to always stay connected. The endpoints, the end of the tunnel between the VPN may be software and a local computer or actually a VPN connector. A lot of times, too, if you look at Cisco and Juniper, they actually have modules that handle VPN traffic for you. So all that's really built into that switch, right? We have to get the actual module, right? They're going to charge us for it. But all that technology is what? Network connecting, 
making sure, especially if you're home, once again, remote device and networking device is encrypted. So when I'm at home and I spin up my VPN and connects to corporate, right, all that traffic is encrypted. So if somebody's sniffing on my route or trying to sniff traffic on the internet, uh, without those keys, they wouldn't be able to read that data. VPN connects a dedicated hardware device that aggregates thousands of VPNs. When using a VPN, there's two operations. Our traffic is sent to the VPN connector and protected called a full tunnel. Only some of it's routed over the secure VPN while other traffic is directly to the internet called split tunnel. Um, split tunnels become super popular. The reason why is if I go to a resource on VPN, once I connect to the VPN, I get my uh, private key and my public key and my network's connection. Um, since it's connected, I don't need to go back to the VPN tunnel because I already have a key and I'm, I'm, I'm encrypted as I go over a web, uh, regular browser. You see regular browser with a lock. We talked about that last session. Lock means I'm encrypted. So the VPN will make sure you get there safely, you get all your information, you get your, your security, then you want to go split tunnel. The reason why you want to go split tunnel is when you go through a VPN you, and you continue to go through VPN, that's a lot of resources, a lot of individual connections. Because I know when we actually went full time before COVID, they had to buy a ton of more VPN connectors. Because usually you only have a couple thousand people working at night or working through the day on VPN. When the whole office went, I think that was 15,000 people, right? That was going to be connected, you know, all the time. So they had to get more information. But VPN is a standard way for that to happen. <clears throat> Mail gateway. Uh, everybody uses mail. You want to make sure now that you have an internet that's secure. There's two different type of email systems. One system uses TCPI protocol to send and receive uh, SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol, or POP, uh, post office protocol. All those are standard acronyms. IMAP, Internet Mail Access Protocol, is a more recent advanced email. With IMAP, email remains on the email servers, not downloaded to a computer. Mail Gateway monitors emails uh, for unwanted content and prevent these messages from being delivered. For inbound emails, the Mail Gateway can search for various types of malware, spam, and phishing attacks. Outbound email through a gateway can detect and block the transmission of sensitive data. So if you're at work and somebody's trying to send out SSNs or <laughs> bank accounts, um, it's called, I think they're going to talk about it later, uh, DLP, when you send it out, it says, okay, this information <laughs> looks sensitive. This is somebody that's just sitting in. I'm going to block this information and not send it out. Why? It's going to block It's going to send it to the security team. Then the security team will make a decision if that software should be sent out. All right. But the use, does the use of, this is from Will, does the use of VPN take a lot of data consumption from users? I compare, uh, as compared to using the internet without using, oh yes, the VPN takes, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, it's a, it's its own specialized hardware. And a lot of times too is the reason you use a VPN tunnel is, uh, when you use a browser, it's encrypted, it's pretty good, right? Some applications are set up to use encryption from a browser. It's going to actually send traffic over 8080. So without that, you have to send it through a VPN tunnel because since it's over uh, traffic and it's clear that uh, there's just there's old applications that doesn't encrypt uh, all your transmissions. But now uh, VPN is definitely more data consumption from a user by far. Um, network intrusion detection can detect and attacks as they occur. Inline IDS connects directly to the network and monitors the flow of data as it occurs. Passive IDS connects to a port on a switch that receives a copy of network traffic. ID systems can be managed inbound through the network itself by using network protocols and tools and out of band using an independent dedicated channel to uh, reach each device. And I think the slide is going to break those down. Um, function, connection, inline directly, uh, passive connected to the port. 
Con uh, function traffic flows routed through the device receives a copy of the traffic. Blocking can block attacks. Passive cannot block attacks. Detection inline may disrupt servers. Passive may cause false alarm. So depending on where you want to check that information and how each one of those actually has uh, positive and negatives. It's all good, Wilton. If you got any more questions, Wilton, just throw them in the box. I got you. So once again, this is introduction to cybersecurity. We're just getting our feet wet. We're not drilling down this thing. We, we're touching each piece of technology to make you aware of what that needs to what needs to be handled with that as an introductory class, right? So we're talking about intrusion detection. We talked about mail servers. We talked about uh, routers, Cisco, right? But we're just touching on that from a cybersecurity perspective, right? On each one of those. So monitor uh, methodologies, anomaly-based monitoring compares current uh, detected behavior with the baseline. Signature looks for well-known attack signature. That's usually virus protection and scanning. It has a signature of the virus, the signature of that type of attack, right? So signature based. Behavior-based detects anomaly actions by processes or programs and alert to users a desire whether to allow or block activity. Activity, heuristics, user based techniques. So, a lot of times when you talk about heuristics, we're talking about emails. If you, as you take the spam email and put it into the spam filter, heuristics to say, okay, I see how this email looks. Anything with that source and destination or with that header or with, with this image name in there, right? Since I've said it was bad, the heuristics is going to take that and says, okay, you keep giving me its experiences of bad email, bad data, and now I'm learning of what that looks like and I'm going to block it. Anomalies, the harder, because that means I've got a baseline of traffic on my network. Then when it's anomaly, right, that means it's learning. So at the end of the month, I usually have big files that are 10 gig every, every, end of, every end of the month. When I get a big file at the end of the month, it goes, oh, I'm used to seeing it. But instead of being 100 gig, it's 500 gig, right? So that would be an anomaly. Most of our stuff is 100, 100, 120. Now you're talking about something that's five times the size of that. That's an anomaly. I'm, I'm going to stop that file from going out, right? I'm going to let the security team become aware of that file because that file is five, to, five times the size. Somebody's stealing all our <laughs> client data or something, right? So that's how you learn from an anomaly, right? Right. That's super rare. Most people, you have, you have to have a lot on a high level security to track your baseline to keep track of all that. Right. That's not for uh, small companies. That's usually big companies that do that type of stuff. Right. But we're trying to grow our security. So as we go from signature base to heuristics, right, we're going to keep going up the security ladder until we get there. Two types of IDS, two basic types of this. Host base, we were looking at the uh, Windows firewall for that. Software based application detects and attacks as it occurs. Installed on each system needing protection. Monitor system calls and fires. System access can recognize unauthorized uh, registry modification. Host input and output communications detects anomaly, the disadvantages of, of a host base. We talked about it. Cannot monitor network traffic that does not reach its local system. So if somebody on our network going to other boxes, right? This box won't know of it. Right? Log data is stored locally, resource intensive, and can slow the system down, right? Because any traffic or any uh, yeah any traffic or data goes through that box is going to go through the host space traffic, right? So if you're moving a a, a billion data bytes, right, and a billion traffic to that. It's going to log all that. And two is each one of your servers is going to log that. Right? Theoretically, though, we're going to take those logs. We're going to send it to a SIM and get centralized. But if you're a small company, you don't have a SIM. If you got 10 servers, you got to go to each one of those servers to look and see if somebody's trying to do something um, to attack you in those boxes, right? Because those logs are centrally located. Which is not like I said. If you're a small company, that's that's not a huge deal. It's not a bad thing. You can actually set up uh, from a Linux perspective. You can set up 
grab opt in fed files to look for certain things in your log then it could shoot out an email saying okay this this ip address was blocked but it was internal and it looks like somebody's spoofing right so you can um, look through your log files with those programming files and send stuff to your security team even though it's on a host base so network-based intrusion now you're talking about cisco a juniper and a big boys watches for attacks on the network uh Network intrusion is sensors installed on the firewalls and the routers. Got the information and report back to a central device. Can uh, sign an alarm and log events. Application aware. Specialized. Use contextual knowledge in real time. It can, it can know the version of the OS in which the application is running, as well as what vulnerabilities are present on the systems being protected. Right. So if you look back to Solar Winds and Caseas, they actually gave you a it's called a snore file that actually had those rules in there to tell you if this foreign nation is using these tools to attack, this is what you need to look for, right? That was the contextual knowledge in those log files and what to do. Then it knows the OS of your systems and what you are vulnerable to in those systems, right? So it could block those attacks. You could say you're on Apache 219 and these are the attacks on 219. You can't upgrade yet, but the uh, network intrusion can say, okay, these attacks look like they go for Apache, your version, block them. We, we know what these patterns are. We've seen them. They've been out in a while, so we know what to block on those systems. Right? Intrusion prevention, monitor networks, traffic to immediately block malicious attacks, similar to network uh, detection. Uh, now, IPS locals in line of the firewall allows to be more quickly to take action and block an attack. An application aware uh, knows which applications are running as well and takes an underlying, right? So, inline uh, intrusion protection, right? You got host, network, then you got intrusion protection. That's extra software out there to look for extra things between your network and your host based systems, right? So, there's a ton of products out there that uh, supports that. We talked about a SIM, security information management product. SIM consolidates real-time monitoring and management, analyzes reports. SIM can be separate device, software runs on the hardware, and a service that provided by a third party. That shows you the pretty pictures. So when you talk about a host space SIM, intrusion detection, and intrusion prevention, you want to take all those logs and send them to the SIM, right? Because if two host based things are getting attacked it could be a certain attack done by um, Caseus. it could be a certain attack going from your active directory uh host base to some other host base that's part of that attack and when you put all that knowledge together the sim can say okay these three servers represent a Caseus attack these four servers represent a solar wind attack but you need all that in one central location with the uh, graphics, uh, it's got uh, knowledge base, and it's kind of based on your SOC. So that's what your SOC's going to do. Your SOC's going to say, these are the tags, these are the type of tags. I'm looking inside these logs, and I saw somebody attacked overseas this way. Now I can bring it back on prem and figure out, okay, does that attack happen to them? Is that happening in my environment? But you need to sim because you need all that data in one, in one location. So you can uh, go through it and analyze it. And SIM typically has these features, aggregation, correlation, automatic alert and tr uh, triggers, time synchronization, event duplication, and SIM law, right? So that's all that information of what a SIM gives you. Now, a lot of SIMs are expensive. There's a few open source SIMs, but you need, uh, you need all that information in one location so you can... Uh, like you said, go through it and analyze it, right? There's other network uh, hardware devices that are part of that part of that uh, SIM network to, so you can figure out, figure out how you're gonna happen. Hardware security, SSL decryptors, SSL and TLS uh, accelerators, uh, midway gateway, all right, so hardware security module, dedicated cryptography process that provides protection for the cryptographic keys, SSL decryptor, a separate device that decrypts SSL traffic, 
The accelerator is a separate hardware card that inserts into a web server that contains one or more uh, coprocessors to handle SSL and TLS. Media gateway, a device that converts media data from one format to another. So there's a ton of <laughs> security hardware, security software. You just got to figure out what's best for you, your size, and two is money, right? Money's not infinite, right? And all these uh, products cost. Uh, unified threat model, uh, integrated device that combines several functions, internet content filter, monitors internet uh, traffic and blocks access and pre-selected websites, website security gateway, blocks malicious content in real time and appears to be without first knowing the URL of a dangerous site. So there's places out there that says these are the sites hacked, these are the sites doing bad things. So your web security gateway will have all that as a pattern. Right, security through network architecture, architecture, design of a network that can provide a secure foundation for resisting attacks, creating security zones and using network uh, segregation. A secure approach is to create zones to partition a network so that uh, certain users may enter one zone while access is pro uh, prohibited to others. The most common security zones is DMZ. We were looking at that when we were looking at the web server using network ad address translations to create zones. Right, and, and I talked about that in the video. It's called zero trust. It, zero trust is the way you should set up these zones, these address, and this security. So there's actually a framework out there. So, so once again, we're talking about the DMZ, separate the network located outside the security perimeter to the untrusted uh, users can access the DMZ, but not the secure. So like we were talking about, the DMZ is when you first come on the internet, it's gonna send you to the web server and app server. That's the DMZ. That's the part that uh, lets you, you touch it on the outside of the uh, uh, internet that can get to. The untrusted side is can access the DMZ, but not secure. So if that internet guy try to actually touch and went straight to the database server, the app server, it will block them. It will say this is coming from the internet. Um, it's not one of our DBAs or admins, so we would just block it, right? So we wouldn't let you go from a untrusted internet to the database or application server. So um, network NAT, network ad address translation, allow private IP addresses to be used on the public internet. It replaces IP addresses with public addresses. The advantage of the NAT, and we talked a little bit about that before. It masks the IP address of the internal device. An attacker who captured the packet of the internal and the internet can determine the actual IP of the address internally. Right, so this shows you the the user he's sending out 192.168.192 is a private, of course, private IP address. You go to the NAT, it's going to go from 19268 to 19468. And the 91468 gets sent out on the, on the network, right, to, to the internet. And that's actually a different address than the 168.03, right? Because we don't want the uh, internal hackers to be aware of our uh, internal addresses. Other zones, you got the intranet zone, a private network that belongs to organizations that can only be accessed by approved inter internal users, extranet. Private network can be accessed by authorized external customer, vendors, and partners. So if you got bank, post office, I'm just trying to think, universities, right? Those will be in your extra net. The guest network is separate open network that anyone can access with prior, right? So you have your people come up, you see all those in the hospitals and right. It's just a regular um, guest network you can log on. Usually there's no security, right? Let's see. I'll keep it tech, you're still in the house. Okay, network segmentation. Physical network segmentation isolates the network so that it's not accessible by outside users. In their gap, the absence of any type of connection between a device, in this case, a secure network or other. So I got in a fight. The guy said he had an air gap. He said, my, my machines are air gap. I said, well, how are you getting security updates? He says, well, I'll take the machine and i hook it up to the internet. Then I go, as soon as you hook it up to the internet, we don't have an air gap, right? As soon as you get those updates for that software, as soon as you plug it in, 
their air gap is gone. So as soon as you plug it up, attackers are trying to attack. Now, granted, their odds of that are smaller because you're not keeping it plugged up, but you don't have an air gap. As soon as you get updates from the internet to open that up, right? You 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 broke your air gap. Virtual LAN uh, allows uh, scattered users to be logically grouped together, even if attached to different switches. Can isolate sensitive data to VLAN members. Communicate on a VLAN if connected to the same switch and handles packet transfer. Special tagging protocol is used for communication between the switches. So I can have dudes in two different offices and put them on a virtual VLAN because one office is, is accounting and the other one is auditing and I want them on the same VLAN. Right, so you can start grouping stuff together. Once again, I'd be network bro, <laughs> Dewan, right? Those are advanced features, but from a security perspective, especially an introduction, you, you gotta understand what that is. Right? Two types of technologies that can help secure a network, network access control and data loss prevention. So the NAT examines the current state of the system or network device before it can connect to the network. Any device that does not meet a specified uh, set of criteria only can be quarantined network with the security deficiencies are correct. The goal of NAC is to prevent computers with suboptimal security from potentially infecting other computers on the network. The NAC uses software agents to, get, to gather information and report back on the health of the organization. An agent may be a permanent agent or a dissolvable agent that disappear after reporting information. The NAC technology can be embedded to Microsoft Windows Active Directory. Domain control and the NAC uses AD to scan a device called an agentless NAC. And that shows you coming in. <clears throat> we just gonna have a quick security self-assessment. You cooked your net your uh, laptop up to the network, you VPN. It takes the state of the health is sent to the health registry authority. If you pass, you get a health certificate issued to the client. The health uh, certificate is presented to the network server. Uh, if no health certificate, uh, the client is quarantined. And if you get a good health server, right, you get added to the network. So the big question, a uh, big issue with that, not a big issue, but why we use it is, especially from Microsoft AD and it uses uh, Windows Defender. If you hook your network and you you didn't update your OS and you're on a bad OS, right? We could say this system cannot hook up to this network because we need to update the, the Windows OS on this system. Or we had McAfee on this system and for some reason it was disabled and it hasn't got the necessary updates. But there could be viruses on this machine. So when you do that NAC, the NAC can say, okay, push those updates to it. Once he gets updated, it looks good. Or he can't update it. He needs to bring his laptop into the office, right? So those are the things that NAC does from a health perspective. And Windows Defender is actually um, great at that the part of that NAC and uh, making sure you're up to date. DLP is a security tool that's used to recognize and identify a critical organization and ensures it's protected. Two common DLPs monitor emails through mail gateway blocking a copy of files to USB file system. Uh, most DLP systems are content inspection and divine as a security analysis of the transaction with improved content. <coughs> so um, big organizations, uh, they don't let you just hook a USB drive in your PC. We know you might steal some, so you have to get approval by your supervisor to be able to do a USB to that, to that PC. All right, we're gonna block it. When you send your email out, if it's not encrypted in DLP, you can read it, right? If we think it's um, social security number, bank account, we're going to block it, right? Number one is when you send it out, it should be encrypted to wherever you send it to. And if it's not, we got to figure out why it's not and the DLP can read it, right? So those are probably going to be the next two. Content inspections look is only for security level at the data. Who's requesting it? Where is the data stored? When it was requested and where it's going? There's three types of DLP sen uh, sensors, kind of like the network, network sensors, storage agent sensor, and, and uh, agent sensor, right? Where you store it and where you send sending it, and two is the agent's able to read it. When a policy is uh, violated, detected by a DLP agent, it's reported back to the DLP server, and the server can block the data, 
redirected to an individual who can examine the request, quarantine the data until later, or alert a supervisor of the request. All right, so, and if you look at Microsoft and AWS, they have DLPs out there for cheap, right, to, to check on the organization. So once again, this was the network piece. It was high level. Like I said, we were just touching some pieces. There were some good questions. So that's it for the day. This is Professor Black Ops. Please subscribe. If anybody got any questions, I'm going to wait a minute. Uh, keep it techy. I appreciate you for coming out, man. Uh, he got me in the game. He did me a couple interviews and helped me get a few subscribers. So shout out uh, to keep it techy. Saluting the, the big boss for joining us today. I appreciate it. Once again, I'm going to hang out. That's it. Um, you can go back to we, uh, just basic networking stuff. Um, the second level is we're going to take that basic stuff at the end of this and move all that stuff to AWS and figure out what that would look like in the cloud. But once again, Professor Black Ops. Okay, Wilton, I have this block by my Windows Defender DVD can make any changes to memory. Uh, <laughs> are you, is that your machine or are you using a corporate machine? Are you using your work machine when you get that? Um, when you get that blocked. Uh, it sounds like that a corporate machine. You're going to need to get your uh, IT security to stop blocking that. Huh? That's weird. Is that your corporate machine, Wilton, or is that your personal machine? Okay. It's a block on my Windows Defender. If you right click, I mean, I don't have Windows Defender. If you right click on Windows Defenders, I think it's going to give you options to cut that off. If you look into your own, um, bring up your list. No, that's cool. Bring up your list, right click on uh, Windows Defender. It should give you options, and one of those should be options in the back for the, for the DVD uh, data collection. You should be able to shut it off. I don't have. I would. I would Google it. I don't have Windows Defender on my machine. Actually, I'm using my corporate machine. <laughs> so, uh, just look that up in the Windows Defender. It should be part of your options in the back end to shut that down. Do me a favor, Wilton. Look into my uh, community clock tab. You'll see my email address in there. If you're still having that problem, just shoot me an email, and I'll reach out to one of my resources to see. I don't use Windows Defender very often. But if you keep having that problem, look on my community tab. Uh, it's, it's Professor Black Ops at gmail.com. Shoot me an email, and I'll reach out to one of my uh, personal resources that uh, do uh, Windows Defender all the time. Um, I can I can see if if he can uh, help us out on that. If anybody does have any questions, I'm out for today. Everybody have a great weekend. Everybody work a little tomorrow. Lab every day. Keep your skills up, Professor Black Ops. I am out.